All right, um, our first speaker of today, um, he's the author of God, the Failed Hypothesis, as well as The Comprehensible Cosmos. He has debated numerous theologians and is super awesome. So please welcome Victor Stanger. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, sir. Well, thanks for inviting me here again. I was here last year. Uh, I was originally scheduled to talk after Sam, and uh, I figured he'd be pretty entertaining, and I didn't want to talk after him, so I asked to talk before him. <laughs> I failed to realize that I'd be talking after Rebecca Watson and James Randi and, and P.Z. Myers and Joe Nickel and, and uh, Richard Carrier, who were all professional entertainers as far as I could tell, as, as, as well as having some very deep things to say. So, uh, so I have to try to make it a little bit of a show, I suppose. I should mention that when, after Rebecca's talk last night, we were walking out of the auditorium, I, got, I was talking to this woman, and I asked her, uh, you know, how she liked the, uh, the conference, and she said, oh, she was having just a wonderful time, and she said she hadn't laughed so hard since her husband died. <laughs> But I, maybe, maybe the subject itself will be entertaining. Maybe I can actually put this up here, you know? Make a little readjustment here. Yeah, that's better. Now, the topic is uh, physics uh, being misrepresented and misunderstood. We've seen many times already uh, how much biology is misrepresented and misunderstood by creationists. And uh, not, uh, we don't hear too much about how physics is actually being misrepresented as well by, by theists, and not only theists, by, but also uh, spiritualists. Uh, you know, there's 15% of the nation right now uh, that does not belong to any church, and a, a steadily rising number, especially among young people, so you know, they're the ones that are going to uh, survive, and the rest of us die off. Uh, and, uh, but of that 15%, you know, maybe only half uh, are willing to call themselves atheists. The other half still have, the, uh, have a tendency to think that there must be something out there, even if it's not the Judeo-Christian Islamic God, it must be something. Uh, and uh, they uh, have been pretty much sold a bill of goods by the so-called spiritualism, the New Age movement, and so I'm going to also talk a bit about that because the claims there are, are, are based on physics also, based on quantum mechanics. So let me begin. So here are the claims that uh, are being made. First, that the eternal universe is mathematically impossible. You'll hear this from William Lane Craig in particular in his debates. And I, I've heard uh, uh, other debaters they use the same argument, other theist debaters. The second claim is that the universe began with a, a singularity. Third is that the universe is fine-tuned for life, in particular human life. And that quantum mechanics says we can make our own reality. Now let's start with the uh, eternal universe, the question of the eternal universe. Uh, uh, of course, we know that the universe, our universe, began with the Big Bang. Uh, however, the current thinking in cosmology is that uh, our universe is, was not the only universe, there's others out there. Our universe could have come from an earlier universe. In other words, the universe uh, is eternal. That's always been pretty much the scientific uh, teaching that the the universe didn't have a beginning, that it's eternal. Now, Craig and others argue that the 
eternal universe is mathematically impossible. Because uh, if you see in this, this picture here, if the universe started out at, at infinite time ago, it would have taken an infinite time to reach the present. So we would never reach the present. That, that's, the, that's the argument. And believe me, I hear this argument a lot. And it's just wrong. Uh, because a mathematician will tell you that an eternal universe is possible. Because uh, the way I, I like to put it is that an eternal universe didn't have a beginning, not a beginning an infinite time ago. You just go back and back and back in time, just like, well, think of going forward in time. Just count, count the ticks on a clock. You keep going forward, 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 and you uh, never reach infinite time. There's no such thing as infinite time. There's no such thing as an infinite number. There is no number equal to infinity. There's just, and when we use infinity in science, we really mean just a very big number or an endless, a, a number that uh, uh, is, is endless. And that's what we mean by an eternal universe. It, exists, it always existed in the past, and it will always exist in the future, even when there's no stuff left that still, time could still be defined. So uh, no matter how far back you go in time, it was a finite time to reach the present. So that takes care of that issue. And since I have to also be entertaining, let me mention uh, something in passing, and that is that I heard that the, um, the Vatican is trying to modernize, uh, you know, bring in, come into the 21st century, so they've designed a new, a new communion wafer that has only half the calories and a third as many, uh, a third as much fat. They call it, I can't believe it's not Jesus. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> back to the universe. The theologian will tell us that, uh, such as William Lane Craig, will tell us, tell us that the universe began with a, a singularity. What's a singularity? A singularity is, is uh, an in infinitesimal point in space of infinite, again, these are the words infinite again, infinite uh, density. And this is the kind of picture I'm going to show you now in several places. It's, it's a space-time diagram. Time is the vertical axis, and space is, is indicated by these two axes. Now, of course, space is three-dimensional, but we're showing a projection of it onto two dimensions, all right? So, so at any given time, the universe is a circle rather than a sphere, let's say. That's a projection of the sphere is a, is a circle. So here's the universe at some time. And it starts over here at time t equals zero. And it, the early part of the universe is an exponential expansion called inflation. So this is an exponential curve here until that stops. I won't show it any further than that. And the universe then is moving along this time axis. And then back in 1970, Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose derived a theorem. They derived a theorem based on general theory of relativity, Einstein's general theory, that said that the universe had to begin with a uh, singularity, uh, uh, that infinite point, in, infinitesimal point of infinite energy density. And, and Craig and other theologians have argued that that had to be the beginning of time itself, so that the universe had to have a beginning. And of course, uh, uh, I was trying to argue that earlier that there's an eternal universe, and, and they, of course, don't like the idea of an eternal universe because he, if you have an eternal universe, you don't have any creator. So you have to have a creator to be consistent with uh, certainly Christian and uh, Islamic and, and uh, Hebrew uh, theology. And so the claim is that that's the, that had to be the beginning of time itself. The universe had to have a beginning, and that was our Big Bang occurred at that point. However, that was based on a theorem that uh, was arrived in 1970. And since that time, in, in fact, already, uh, you know, almost 30 years later, uh, for, be, uh, prior to now, that, that is to say, uh, Stephen Hawking in his, in his book, uh, The Brief History of Time, uh, says that the universe uh, didn't have a singularity. It wasn't that he and Penrose had made a mistake, 
the calculation was correct as far as the assumptions were concerned. They assumed uh, just the general theory of relativity, but they didn't take into account quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics uh, says that there's no time that you can define smaller than the Planck time, which is 10 to the minus 44 seconds. And so the universe didn't begin with a point. It began with this little region in there uh, of Planck dimensions. And so what about the Big Bang? Well, here's, here's a, a possibility, at least. The universe uh, expands from some region of chaos in, in here. This is all uh, quite reasonable. And, and, and it actually, uh, our universe could have tunneled. There's a process called quantum tunneling that we've known about for 50 years. And, uh, uh, is well confirmed quantum effect that you can you can walk I could walk through that wall uh, there's some probability if I walk I walk into that wall I'll walk straight through it uh, it's a very low probability on the macroscopic scale but on the quantum scale and the subatomic scale that probability becomes uh, uh, fairly large and so uh, here we we're working at these small distances in time they're working at the quantum level and there can be a, could have been a tunneling from an earlier universe. And this uh, uh, scenario has been worked out completely mathematically. I've worked it out in, in a book I wrote uh, called uh, uh, The, the uh, Comprehensible Cosmos. I've written so many books that I forget the names of all of them. Now, so that's. So the universe didn't have to have a beginning. This is, that's the uh, second conclusion, uh, despite the claims of theologians. And while I'm talking about the Vatican, <laughs> that reminds me of another story. This one goes back, you may have heard this one, it goes back to the, to the time when uh, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken was, uh, KFC was called Kentucky Fried Chicken and Colonel Sanders was still alive. And the story is that he called the Pope one day, and he, he said, I'll offer you a million dollars uh, donation to the Vatican if you'll change the words of the Lord's Prayer to read, give us this day our daily chicken. <laughs> and the Pope says, oh, I can't do that. I mean, that, that prayer was, was given to us by Jesus uh, uh, on the Sermon of the Mount. And, and so Colonel Sanders says, well, what about two million dollars? And he well, I don't know. I mean, the Pope says, it's, it's, this is a tradition. People have been praying this way for 2,000 years. And Colonel Sanders says, well, okay, let's make it $10 million. So the Pope says, okay, ten, I can't turn that down. So he makes the deal with Colonel Sanders. Next day he calls uh, together a meeting of the College of Cardinals and he says, I've got some good, the Pope says, I've got some good news and some bad news. So the good news is that is that uh, a Colonel, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken is going to donate $10 million to the Vatican. And so after the applause dies down, somebody, one of the cardinals yells out, so what, what's, what's the bad news? And he says, well, the Pope says, the bad news is we've lost our Wonder Bread account. <laughs> so. well, at least I'm trying to be entertaining after, <laughs> after all these. I, th I think uh, J JT and his, his colleagues uh, pick speakers for their entertainment value at this meeting. Well, they all, again, they also have a lot of good things to say. Sure, but I don't want, I don't want to down, downplay that. Anyway, so the next step is that the universe is fine-tuned. This is, right now, I would say this is the most uh, Im important statement uh, impo important issue in the intellectual debate between uh, theists and atheists. It's not evolution. Evolution's pretty much established scientifically. Sure, there's still fights in the schools to deal with, but this is an intellectual battle that has not been won yet by, uh, by the non-believers. Because most non-believers uh, don't know the answer to it. And that includes a lot of the people who speak. I've heard Christopher Hitchens and, and others uh, debate uh, atheists, uh, debate theists. I 
And uh, when the theists bring up this subject to fine tuning, they don't know how to answer it. Not just Christopher, but the only one out there who knows how to answer is me. Well, maybe a few other physicists, but the other physicists keep their mouths shut, so that's, uh, that's uh, too bad. I think they have to start speaking up. Anyway, let me get, give you the argument. Now, Roger Penrose, again, we've heard of him already with Stephen Hawking, very famous mathematician and cosmologist. Way back in 1979, I think it was, he wrote a book uh, called The Emperor's New Mind, and in it he had this picture of the creator uh, with a little pointer uh, to uh, this region of space. That's actually phase space. That's the space in which you plot all the states of a system in, in physics. And uh, that defines the state of the system. And the state of the system that uh, uh, is our universe uh, is only one point out of one and 10 to the 10 to the 123 possibilities. And so it looks like uh, uh, it's very, un very unlikely to have been that particular state. But then it had to be some state. And uh, so you can't just use a probability argument there. The, uh, uh, it could have been any one of any one of those states if it's a random choice. And the argument that's made is if the constants of physics had been slightly different, life as we know it would not have evolved. That's the fine-tuning argument. It's also known as the anthropic principle. I'm sure you've all heard that. Now, uh, I'll, I have a lot of quotations from people. Here's one from an astronomer, Edward Harrison. Uh, and it, here he says that here is the cosmological proof of the existence of God, the design argument of Paley, updated and refurbished. The deistic design, no, the fine tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence of deistic design. Take your choice, blind chance, uh, that requires a multiples of universe or design that requires only one, and there are many statements by uh, both theists and, and, science, and many scientists of, of that nature. So let's uh, look at, at the question of does the universe seem to be designed for humans? Was the universe designed for life in general, or humans in particular? Well, first of all, the galactic space around Earth is not teeming with complex life. Earth is, uh, in fact, the only known planet with with life. Certainly none of the planets in our solar system have, have intelligent life. Maybe there's some primitive life at the bottom of uh, some sea on some moon someplace, but uh, certainly we haven't discovered it. We haven't discovered life on Mars. Uh, and uh, even then, it would be the most primitive kind of life. And the galaxy, uh, it, it, the universe is huge, as, as you, I'm sure you know. It's a huge amount of wasted space. If, if uh, the, the universe was designed for us, why would there be so much space out there? Let's just look at some of the numbers. The distances, of course, are immense. The nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away. The nearest galaxy is over 2 million light years away, Andromeda, which is shown in the background there. And the, there are galaxies, the galaxies within our horizon that are, that are visible to us in principle are uh, up to 40 billion light years away. And if you believe the inflationary model of cosmology, the universe uh, began and, uh, uh, with the hu huge exponential expansion in the first 10 to the minus 35 seconds. It, it increased in size by many orders of magnitude. And so most of the universe is beyond our horizon. And how much of it? Estimates are as much are that the universe beyond our horizon is 10 to the 10 to the 100 times bigger than what's so visible to us. I mean, an immense universe. We, our universe, we think the, our universe is big. We think our galaxy is big. They are smaller than a grain of sand on the Sahara Desert. That's, that's how much universe there is. And that's just our universe. There may be no reason not to believe there are many other universes as well. So why would God have done that all just for us? Hard to believe. It's also wasted time. The universe is, uh, our universe is 13.7 billion years old. 
the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and modern humans have been around for 150,000 years. Can everybody see those okay, or should we dim the lights? Is it okay? So humans have only been on in the universe for one thousandth of one percent of the time that the universe has existed. And maybe we'll go on for another two or three thousandths of a percent before we're wiped out. The sun will eventually uh, be expand into a red giant that will engulf the earth. And that'll be the end of life as we know it. And if you think we're ever going to go to other stars, forget about it. Forget about it. I mean, this whole business of, of, of thinking that uh, humanity will be able to move off through the stars is totally impossible. We, we can't even leave the solar system without being killed by cosmic radiation. By the time we got out of the solar system, we'd all be dead. And that's, that's only a, 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 you know, a few light years. Uh, so maybe our robots, our computers, will be able to survive but uh, humans and the chances of us finding a planet exactly suited for us are infinitesimally small. Even if there are some life-like, uh, so-called Earth-like planets nearby, uh, the chances that they would have all the properties that we, could, we needed to live uh, is, is, is uh, an impossible. So. The other point is we, think, we tend to think the universe is a very orderly place. That's because we live in an orderly part of the universe. Actually, most of the universe is in random motion. Let's take the cosmic microwave background, which is uh, shown here after much of it has been subtracted. This is just to show the fluctuations in it, which are one part in 100,000. So the cosmic microwave background, the photons in the cosmic microwave background are a billion times more numerous than atoms, than the atoms in the universe. There's also neutrinos of the same amount. Uh, and they're all random to one part in 100,000. So the universe is, very, is quite random, and uh, uh, we happen to live in a, a tiny pocket of complexity. Now, you would have thought that an intelligent designer with special regard for humanity would have done a much better job, would have made it possible for life to live elsewhere than the Earth. We could, why, why couldn't he have had us live in space, be able to live on Mars? Certainly, an omnipotent God would have had that power. So, uh, that seems very, very unlikely. It's time for my next joke. <laughs> you know, Thanksgiving just went by. I mean, not, uh, not Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's still to come. Halloween just went by. And there was this, uh, this boy who decided he was going to dress up like Jesus. Uh, a Jesus costume, and it didn't work out very well because the trick-or-treat candy kept falling through the holes in his hands. <laughs> so. All right, I better, I better stop there on the jokes. <laughs> I have more, but uh, nah. Joel, as I'm telling these jokes to so many people now, I won't be able to use them again because you'll, you'll, you'll all been, you'll heard, you'll have heard them. Now, those, uh, let's get into some of the more technical details on the fine-tuning claim. Um, let's first start with some obvious fallacies. The, uh, there are two constants, fundamental constants in physics, speed of light C, the speed of light in a vacuum, actually, and Planck's constant H. And you will often read in arguments given by theists about fine-tuning, and believe me, you, you pick up, you pick up uh, any book, practically, uh, written by Christians that talks about uh, science, they give you the fine-tuning argument. Just walk into any bookstore, go to the Christian section, and pick a, random, a book at random, and you'll see uh, this argument of, of fine-tuning. Well, okay, so the speed of light and H, if they had been slightly different, you know, and life couldn't have evolved, blah, 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 that's, that's, that's what you'll read. However, if you know any physics, you know that uh, they're just arbitrary constants. You could, you could give any value you want, because they just 
They just set the units in which you're going to measure uh, things. If you're going to measure time in seconds and uh, distance in, in uh, meters, then you define C to be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If you want to use uh, years as, as your unit of time and light years as your unit of distance, then C is equal to 1, 1 light year per year. So it's, it's, it all depends on what unit you want. And the same thing with H. Uh, it's, it's an arbitrary number. Now there's some extreme examples that you'll find without which it is claimed any form of life would be impossible. Let me just go, there's only about four or five of them. The ratio of the number of electrons to protons in the universe that is supposedly fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 37. The ratio of the electromagnetic force to gravity is fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 40. Uh, for example, if the two forces were equal, uh, there wouldn't be any universe as we know it because without gravity being uh, weak compared to the electromagnetic force, uh, the universe would, co would collapse from gravitational attraction immediately. It has to, gravity has to be pretty weak to keep the universe stable. The expansion rate of the universe is supposedly fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 55th. The mass density of the universe, one part in 10 to the 59th. And finally, I'll mention the cosmological constant, which is a, a parameter in Einstein's general theory of relativity, cosmological parameter. Uh, one part in 10 to the 120. So this is what you'll read. Now let me mention, uh, let's, let's start with uh, one of them, or a pair of them, by quoting the Christian apologists, Dinesh D'Souza and William Lane Craig. They quote Stephen Hawking in his uh, bestseller book, A Brief History of, uh, a Brief History of Time, which came out in 1988. On page 122, Hawking says, at least in the, my edition, page 121, if the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in 100,000 million million, the universe would have collapsed before it ever reached its present size. And, and that's an exact quotation from Stephen Hawking. And that's quoted, and then you'll find it's quoted not only by these guys, but all the people who write, usually these guys who write, read William Lane Craig, and then write what he says, uh, without questioning it. Now, both of these authors and the others ignore the rest of the story, because if you just go seven pages later on page 128, Pick up your book and look this up for yourself. Hawking says the rate of expansion of the universe and the inflationary model, he's talking about the inflationary model now, would automatically become very close to the crit critical rate determined by the energy density of the universe. This could then explain why the rate of expansion is so close to the critical value without having to assume the initial rate of expansion of the universe is, was very carefully chosen. In other words, inflation takes care of it. The inflationary model gives you exactly what's observed and there's no fine-tuning necessary. Now the other one is gravity and electromagnetism. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that you've heard this, if you ever sat, heard a physicist talk, if you ever took a cl uh, physics class even in high school, I've certainly said it probably hundreds of times in my classes, and that is, gravity is much, much weaker than the uh, electricity, the electrical force. And that's based on the following calculation. You have an electron and a proton, and they're separated by a distance r. You can calculate the ratio of the electric to gravitational forces. Now I'm going to put an equation down here, and that's just for the aficionados, people who, like, who know equations. But basically, we can calculate the ratio of the force, of the uh, electrical force to the gravitational force. Uh, it's the ratio of the Coulomb uh, force law and the Newtonian gravitational force law. The, the distance cancel out. They're both 1 over r squared laws. And you get this result. It depends on the charges and it depends on the masses. And so if you put in 
the charge of the proton and electron, which is the unit electric charge, and their masses. You put that in, you get the following number, 10 to the 39. So the electrical force is between an electron and a proton, no matter what their distance is, uh, the electrical force is 10 to the 39 times stronger than the uh, gravitational force. And, and, and of course, uh, those are basic particles in nature, they make up atoms, and uh, in the universe, therefore, uh, can, uh, doesn't collapse immediately for that, for that reason. And so that's where the 10 to the 39, 10 to the 40 fine tuning comes in. But you see, it depends on the charges and the masses here. The charges are here, the masses are here. And if, uh, suppose we just put in some different charges and masses. Well, let's, let's let the charges be the same to be, for simplicity, the unit electric charge, but let the masses be equal to this number here. It's not important what the number is. Then you find the forces are equal. In other words, there's actually no universal way that you could define the strength of gravity. It depends on the masses involved. And so this puzzle, why is gravity so much weaker than electromagnetism, is not a puzzle at all. Uh, it's, just, it's just because the masses are small. That's the, that's the actual real puzzle. The real puzzle is why are the masses so small? And in the standard model of particles uh, and fields, it's been around since uh, the 70s, and has agreed with all of the data so far, although the New Hadron Collider in, in Geneva hopefully will find deviations from it. Uh, can't be right uh, for all energies. Anyway, in the standard model, I don't want to go anywhere, I'm not going to speculate any further beyond what we now know, and what we now know is that in the standard model, all particle masses are intrinsically zero. And they pick up a small mass uh, as a correction. So the reason the, the masses are small are simply uh, uh, that they're really fundamentally zero, and the mass that they have is just due to a, a tiny correction. And that's why they're small, and then that's why gravity is so much weaker than uh, uh, electricity. So it's amazing how many physicists aren't aware of this really simple fact. Now the cosmological constant is the last one I'll, I'll mention. It appears in general relativity, and this is kind of an interesting one. It's assumed to be the source of the vacuum energy of the universe. That is, the universe is, if you take all the particles away you still have it, and you have a vacuum, there's still energy in there, according to quantum mechanics. And so you can calculate that energy. And, uh, and it's assumed to be responsible for the acceleration that we observed back in 1998, that the universe's expansion is accelerating. And you calculate the vacuum energy to have this value, 10 to the 115 GeV per cubic centimeter. GeV is a billion electron volts. So that's an energy density. And that's what you calculate. And then if you have, well, what is the value? So it's, what is the true value of the energy? Well, it has an up, upper limit of 10 to the minus 5. So there's a difference of 120 orders of magnitude. Okay? So our calculation is off by 120 orders of magnitude. Now, that is the worst calculation in the history of physics. It can't be right. It's obviously wrong. Why? You know, just, just ignore it. It's wrong. And that calculation just, uh, so, the, now a lot of, there, there are some physicists who still think, well, you know, we have to have multiple universes to, to uh, fine tune the cosmological constant. Well, the cosmological, this calculation is simply wrong. Now, there are actually about half a dozen different possibilities that have been uh, given for the uh, scenarios that have been given for the cosmological constant value, and there's a new one called the holographic principle, not new, it's been around about five years or so, and here's a tentative explanation. If you take a sphere, the maximum information on that sphere uh, that that sphere can contain is proportional to the area, not the volume. That's why it's called the holographic principle. You lose the dimension. All the information is projected 
onto the surface of the sphere. Now, I'm not going to try to prove it to you, but it can be proven. And, and if you use that and you calculate what the energy density is, you get exactly uh, what is observed, or at least about what is observed, the order of magnitude. So that's a possibility. It's, it's just tentative, it's still going to be argued over, that, and that's uh, the way it is. So, so the extreme examples that I gave you about which it is claimed any form of life would be impossible uh, are all, all have easy explanations. I didn't discuss this one, the ratio of electrons to protons, but that has a very easy explanation. It's just what it should be if you had charge conservation, the total charge of the universe is zero, which is what it should be if it came from nothing. Uh, and uh, in fact, that's what we'll find all along here. The universe looks exactly like it should if it came from nothing. So zero charge came from nothing, and that means the, the ratio of electrons, protons, they have to be equal numbers. It's as simple as that. We just showed that the, the ratio of electromagnetic force to gravity is, is explained by the, the low mass of elementary particles. The expansion rate in the, of the universe is explained by inflation. The mass density of the universe is also explained by inflation, and the cosmological constant has a tentative explanation. Uh, and as long as we can provide a plausible explanation for anything, uh, you can't, you can't uh, be, uh, assume that there has to be a creator until the God of the gaps argument requires that you prove that there's no answer to the gap in our knowledge other than God, and no one's ever been able to do that. So nine, no fine tuning is necessary. Let me just quickly mention uh, some of the other parameters that are not uh, that crucial. Uh, a lot of calculations have been made, including one of my own that goes back to 1995, and is published in my book, The Unconscious Quantum, uh, is, is that you can vary the constants by quite a bit and still get some form of life uh, possible. Yes, I agree that our form of life uh, depends very much on the values of the constants of the parameters that we have, uh, but other forms of life is, are well within ranges of variations. Only those five that I mentioned would prevent any kind of life from being possible, and they're explained. So that takes care of the fine tuning. Let me give you a summary of that part. Uh, the claims of fine-tuning are based on inadequate understanding of the physics involved and incorrect analysis procedures. For example, one of the things that people do that's absolutely wrong is they keep hold one constant, uh, uh, they vary only one constant and hold all the others, uh, uh, let me say parameter rather than constant, they, they, uh, they hold all the parameters constant except one, and they vary one, and that's absolutely incorrect procedure, you have to vary all of them because some can compensate for others. So that's an incorrect procedure. Some parameters have the value they do uh, by definition. Some parameters have exactly the values they have based on standard models, so physics and cosmology. And the remaining parameters are not fixed by standard model, have values within the range expected by those models. So that my conclusion is that only the cosmological constant remains plausible. So, well, this thing keeps falling off here. The universe shows no evidence of being designed with humans in mind. Now, let me move on to the um, next topic, which is quantum spirituality. <laughs> now, this actually goes back uh, quite a while, but it became noticeable again uh, uh, three years ago with the film A Secret and the books that came out with it, as well as another film called What the Bleep Do We Know? And the theme there uh, of The Secret is that quantum mechanics teaches us that we can be what we want to be. All we have to do is think it. You just have to think about it. So you can be beautiful, you can be rich, you can live forever. You can uh, be anything you want just by, just by uh, thinking it. Guaranteed to work, they tell you. It's guaranteed. You read, the, read what they say. 
So let me give you some of the hi history there. The quantum mysticism goes back, as I said, to uh, 40 years ago or something like that, or 30 years, to 1975. That's 25, 35 years ago. With the Tao of Physics, which came, it was written by the physicist Deep, uh, Fritjof Capra, in which he claimed there was an essential harmony between the spirit of Eastern wisdom and Western science, and that kicked off what is, became called the New Age Movement. And the gurus of that New Age Movement, in addition to uh, Capra, uh, included Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of Transcendental Meditation. He was a physicist by training, believe it or not. And he started that movement. He's dead now, but uh, the movement still goes on. And they will tell you that uh, uh, there's a universal field, unified field of intelligence that pervades the universe. And they again use quantum mechanics to, to uh, uh, claim that. The other guy that's still around is Deepak Chopra. He's written a lot of books. But these are the two ones that bear on this issue. Back in 1989, he wrote Quantum Healing, Exploring the Frontiers of Mind by Medicine. Quantum was in the title. And the other one, 1993, Ageless Body, Timeless Mind, The Quantum Alternative of Growing Old. Uh, and so he told us that by following his teachings, you won't grow old. And there he is as he looked in 1993, and here he is. <laughs> there he is today. So he hasn't been thinking hard enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, where does it all come from? This looks a little complicated, but it, it gives the basic idea. I'm sure you've all heard of the double slit experiment. It was a double slit experiment that uh, Thomas uh, uh, Young, back in 1800, demonstrated the wave nature of light. And here, if you, you have an electron gun or a photon gun, you have photons and particles of light. You send them to, through two slits, and you have some detectors over here on, on the wall. And uh, when both slits are open, you get an interference uh, pattern that looks like this. Uh, easily demonstrated with a laser these days. I used to do it in my classes all the time. If you close one slit, you get this, either this distribution or that distribution, depending on which slit you leave open. And the statement is that uh, if both slits are open, you have a wave, because that's a wave interference effect that you see with water waves, for example. And if uh, one slit is open, you have a particle. So it seems to be this, this is a wave particle duality. And, the, and it would seem that the nature of reality seems to depend on what you decide to measure. If you decide to measure a wave property, then it's a wave. If you decide to measure a particle property, then, then it's a particle. And this is the basis of, the whole basis of quantum spirituality, that we make our own reality, because it seems like quantum mechanics is telling us that you, uh, you could decide on the reality of an object, the nature of an object, just by deciding what to measure. And uh, much misunderstood. Let's, let's uh, do the experiment with individual photons where we have a detector that, uh, on the screen, uh, that a whole array of detectors that can detect at the one photon level. We have such detectors today. Uh, uh, that can detect individual photons. In fact, their eyes even come pretty close to detecting individual photons. So it's not hard. So you have, we start out with the uh, first few hits, and you see something that looks more or less random. Both screens are open, uh, both holes in the screens are open, both slits in the screens are open. Uh, as, as you build up the hits, uh, you find that uh, a pattern is beginning to emerge, and when you get a lot of them, there's our interference pattern. Okay, what, what, is, what does this mean? It means that 
particles are being observed even when you're doing the double slit experiment, which is supposedly designed for, look, for measuring wave-like properties. You still observe individual localized particles. Whether you have one slit open or two, slit, or, or two slits open. And what, it, what, what the interference pattern is, is actually statistical. It only appears when you have a lot of photon hits. It only appears statistically. And this is what quantum mechanics says, that the quantum effects are described statistically by the wave function. So that's one thing that indicates there are partic particles, there's no particle duality, that the wave, talks to, wave description just t involves uh, the, st the statistical uh, effects. Now, again, again for the more technical in, of the audience, uh, those of you who are engineers, for example, would uh, be well familiar with the Fourier transform. And you know that in the Fourier transform, uh, if you have uh, a position or you have, a, say, say a, an electrical signal, and it has a, it's well-defined in, in time, it's well-defined in space, in position, uh, you, can, you can do a Fourier transform, it's a mathematical transformation from, from a function of position or time to a function of frequency. And, and so you would say, here's a localized particle, it has all kinds of frequencies, so you wouldn't just want to define that as a wave, you'd want to define that as a, as a, uh, as a particle. So this is a particle, and this is a wave. Now, if you have the other situation where the frequency is well defined, for example, when you have a sine wave, then you would call this the wave and this the particle. So it depends again on, on what you decide, how you just want to describe it. But there, the point is, and I'm sure all of you who, who know about uh, uh, this, that it's the same phenomenon. The same electrical signal could be described either way as a particle or as a, as a wave. They're just two different ways of describing the same phenomenon. And there's, the wave particle duality is just, it has to do with two different descriptions of the same property, not two different realities that you're changing by your consciousness uh, deciding what to measure. Okay, so then what are the answers, I'm winding up here, to the theorist and spiritualist claims? Here, were the, here are the claims again. The eternal universe is mathematically impossible. Well, as I've argued, the eternal universe is mathematically possible. The universe began with a singularity. The universe did not begin with a singularity, for sure. The universe is fine-tuned for life. No, the universe is not fine-tuned for life. And here I'll make, uh, since everybody who talks plugs their books, I'm not going to avoid that. Here's the next book coming out, The Fallacy of Fine-Tuning. be out next, next uh, spring. And incidentally, I'll be signing other books out there. <laughs> the lady from Borders is here uh, and has, has my books available, some of them. Finally, quantum mechanics uh, says that we can make our own reality. No, it doesn't. Quantum mechanics does not say we can make our own reality. So uh, I, I'll end with the picture of the I started out with. This is the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. It's a, a tunnel 17 miles long, super con of, of uh, containing superconducting magnets. Experiment uh, that probably cost a billion dollars to build. Uh, remember, well, one time we were going to have the superconducting super collider, but uh, uh, that was canceled by Congress. And this is almost, that was even going to be bigger than this. It, it was going to be built in Texas, uh, and uh, it was canceled. But, uh, so the U.S. has some involvement in this, but uh, uh, it's, it's an international effort. And the data is starting to come in, and uh, really beginning to look promising that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the preliminary data is already deviating from expectations, so I think uh, finally after having the standard model for, for 
uh, 30 years, you're finally going to be able to move on to the next level of understanding. And believe me, it's very unlikely that we're going to turn up anything remotely connected with the idea of spirit. So thanks very much. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for Q&A, but he will be at the book table doing autographs and answering questions there. So we're going to take a short break, and then we'll, we'll be back. <laughs>